this, this series really is all about um, ideas and ideas that um, hold a great deal of passion. And um, when Nicole asked me if I would consider doing this, I really did hesitate because I thought if I'm going to speak about my passion, um, I might have to leave town after tonight. Um, anyway, I, I gladly took up the, the offer to do this because in some way, I think that um, it is time perhaps to be honest. And I'd like to do that in some way tonight. Um, what I'm going to say is really um, a backdrop or a context for, for the work that I do and who I am. And um, this may seem surprising to a lot of people, but um, I'm going to share it with you tonight anyway. There is a challenge, however, in trying to do this in 20 minutes. Um, so I'm going to be flying very high tonight for the next few minutes. Um, I hope that there will be some local implications and local applications for what I'm about to say. And I, I think there will be, and I, I'm hoping that there's an opportunity for us to have a little kind of a dialogue when I finish. I struggled with the opening line for this, <clears throat> this sharing tonight. And in fact, I was, as I was driving from New Waterford into Sydney tonight, I was still struggling as to whether or not I should use this opening line. And uh, I've decided I'm going to open with the opening line. And here it is. My name is Marty Gillis. I'm a Roman Catholic nun, and I don't believe in God. I don't say this lightly, and I'd like in the next few minutes to explain where I'm moving. <clears throat> My transformation um, about 20 years ago happened with 12 Sisters of Charity, the congregation to which I belong. There were 12 of us from Canada and the United States that came together, and we committed ourselves to a new path of learning and awakening. And the 12 of us were struggling with a great many questions about the future of religious life, the future of nuns, the future of the church. And this work, this exploration, led us to the, uh, to the work of two people, one by the name of Thomas Berry and the other uh, by the name of Brian Swim. And Thomas Berry, who died about two years ago, was a Roman Catholic priest. Uh, but perhaps more significantly, by education, he was a cultural historian and spent a good part of his life in India and China, where he studied the languages and the culture of these countries. And Thomas Berry is considered to be one of the leading environmental and spiritual thinkers of our time. And the second person, Brian Swim. Brian is a mathematical cosmologist and he teaches at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco. And he teaches courses in evolutionary cosmology. And together, Ryan Swim and Thomas Berry authored several books and articles, taught programs and courses, and gave retreats and workshops to a whole range and number of students and seekers throughout the world who are trying to make the connection between the new science and religion and its relevance and relationship to the modern planetary crisis. So what keeps me awake at night and what really is the backdrop and the framework of, of what I do and what I believe is the contemporary environmental and ecological crisis. There are numerous scientists and writers pointing to the environmental and ecological challenges and changes of our day. There's an author by the name of Bill McKibben, and he wrote a book called Earth, E-A-A-R-T-H, Earth. And Bill McKibben says this, our old familiar globe is suddenly melting, drying, acidifying, flooding, and burning 
in ways that no human has ever seen. We've created in very short order a new planet, still recognizable, but fundamentally different. And Thomas Berry himself has said, we are changing the chemistry of the planet. We are changing the biosystems. We are changing the geosystems. But more specifically, we are terminating the last 65 million years of life development on this planet. We have never been in this place before. He says, we are witnessing the irreversible closing down of the Earth's functioning and its major life systems. And he goes on to say that our ethical traditions know how to deal with suicide, homicide, and even genocide, but we're oblivious, oblivious when we're confronted with biocide, which is the extinction of the valuable and the vulnerable life systems of the Earth. Far-fetched? Exaggerated? No, I don't think so. We have enough information now to realize where we are and where we're heading. Thomas Berry would say that our inability to deal with biocide, the shutting down of the Earth's life systems, our inability to deal with this has to do with our cosmology, our belief systems, our story and understanding of who we are why we're here, and what the meaning of life is. And then Barry wrote this marvelous book. It's a book called The Great Work. And in that book, Barry says that the work that needs to be done today is really the work of transforming our contemporary institutions. That our institutions, the church, government, educational institutions, our judicial institutions, healthcare, economics, were all developed within the framework of an old cosmology. So, the meaning of the word cosmology. Cosmology, very simply, is a story, a set of beliefs, an understanding of how life works. And we know that every human culture organizes itself with a fundamental story, a fundamental set of beliefs about how the world works. And these stories, these cosmologies, are powerful determining forces that shape our attitudes, our behaviors, and these stories, these cosmologies, shape our institutions. So story shapes institutions, cosmology shapes institutions. And so over the last few years, we have been witnessing not only environmental an environmental crisis that is unfolding before our eyes, but at the same time we're witnessing the ineffectiveness of very familiar institutions. The institutions that we have relied on for so many years are now very much in question. The institutions that provided answers and solutions and order and meaning to life no longer seem to be working for us. And so our confidence in these institutions is eroding. And we are losing faith in economic systems, or economic institutions, in our governance institutions, our healthcare institutions, and our education institutions. And certainly for many of us, we are losing faith in our church institutions, especially here locally. So, from my reading and study and my, my um, uh, meetings with my 12 cluster sisters, we began to devise a framework, a framework that would help us think about and sort out uh, how we wanted to direct our lives, how we wanted to live out our, our religious vocation. And so I began to think about my own belief system and how that influences my everyday work. So I'm going to present tonight a, a framework that I've been playing around with. And the framework, framework is really designed to help me make the connections. And it's a really, it's a panoramic, wide lens view um, designed to uh, ask questions about where we are and where we need to go, both globally and locally. And it's also 
designed in a way to help us, or to help me, ask myself, what is happening to all these old familiar institutions? Why don't they seem to be able to respond to current problems? What is it that we need to do to change the course that we're on? That is, the course from the extinguishing of life on this planet to the course of flourishing life on this planet. That is stark, but I think it is the reality that we see ourselves in today. So this work framework is really, it's a work in progress. It's incomplete in many ways, and it's probably very inaccurate in other ways, but it may provide some grist for the conversation mill tonight. And I want you to know that I'm making sweeping and simplistic generalizations in my reflections. Uh, so to the framework, and I'm going to kind of highlight some things here on the PowerPoint, and you may not be, be able to see it in the back, so I'll, I'll just explain it as I go. Um, so what I've done in this framework is I've taken some uh, categorical concepts, and I'm defining these concepts within both an old cosmological understanding and a new cosmological understanding. And when I talk about the era of the old cosmology, I'm talking about a time frame that started around probably the 14th and 15th century up to about the 1960s, okay? Now, this time frame could well be debated, debated but for the sake of this evening and in the interest of shortness of time, I'm asking for your indulgence around the accuracies and specifics of this. Okay. Okay, so one of, the, one of the concepts is the concept of the organization of life. In the, in the old cosmology, in our old understanding of the organization of life, it was believed that life had a particular structure. And the structure was like a pyramid. It was a hierarchical structure. And many of us might remember this from our school days. Man was situated at the top, the apex of the pyramid, and actually, if you went to a Catholic school, it was really, God was really up there at the top, and then man was next, and then below man was women and children, below women and children were all the plants, and below the plants and the trees were the, the animals, and then at the very, very bottom of this pyramid was soil and rock, and at that time we called it inert, non-human matter, non-living matter. All right, so that was kind of a, a, a sense of the, how life was organized under the old cosmology. In terms of our understanding of the human being, if we look at our belief about the human in the old cosmology, we understood, we were taught, that the human is a superior being set apart from nature, quite independent and self-sufficient, rational, and in control. That was our understanding of the human in the old cosmology. Our understanding of the planet Earth. In this old cosmology, uh, the Earth was considered to be the center of the universe and all other planets revolved around the Earth. The sun revolved around the Earth. And this was a pre-Copernican, pre-Galilean understanding. But for centuries, we believed that that was the location of the Earth and the universe. It was an old cosmological understanding. Our concept of morality in an old cosmological framework. Morality was about human to human relationships and about human to God relationships. Uh, morality for centuries was understood simply in this way. It was about our sense of principles of right and wrong or good or evil in terms of human to human relationships or human to God. Okay. Gender, this is a favorite of mine. In the old cosmology, the understanding of gender was restricted to two sexes, male and female. And the male sex in this cosmological understanding was seen to be the superior sex. And in fact, as we may remember, women in Canada were only recognized as persons in 1929. Not that long ago, really. Okay? So gender had a specific orientation in the old cosmology. 
Our understanding of time is very interesting when we look at it from the lens of the old cosmological understanding. Time then was different than it is today. Time was slower, change took longer, and permanence was understood as an element of time. So, for example, in the 17th and 18th centuries, it would take months to get a letter, right? Many folks had a job for a lifetime. Some folks would live in the same house all their lives from birth to death. And there was an understanding that when one took vows, either marriage vows or religious vows, that you took these vows for life. They were permanent. Our understanding of knowledge in the old cosmology was that knowledge was the purveyorship of experts, of scholars, of the educated. The experts, the scholars, and the educated in the old cosmology supplied us with the right answers and the right knowledge. They were the knowledgeable of the community, the doctors, the lawyers, the priests. And it was their knowledge and their truth that would set the direction for our lives. So knowledge moved in one direction, from teacher to student. Our understanding of God in the old cosmology, another favorite of mine. God in the old cosmology, it was believed, was a sky god, a god, a transcendent, a way out there. And God was considered to be male. And for those of us who are Christian, God was an image as Christian. And for those of us who are Catholic, didn't you know God was Catholic? In the old cosmology economy, the economy uh, was understood as about being about producers and consumers. Producers produce, consumers consume, and the more each does, the better and the stronger we are. Furthermore, the economy in the old cosmology was extractive. Okay? So we take from the earth to satisfy our needs, our wants, and desires. And the economy in the old cosmology consistently, consistently pointed towards growth. And in its limit, limitless growth and expansion is its success. Okay? That no, understanding that in order for the, con the economy to be healthy, it has to grow endlessly. Our understanding of governance. We have, been, we have governed ourselves in the old cosmological model, and we have used the words uh, empire, uh, centralization, monarchy. These were characteristics of the old understanding of governance in the old cosmological approach. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is just kind of look at these same concepts and look at them from the perspective of a new cosmological understanding. Okay, so if we look at the organization of life today, if we were to think how, or how the life, life is organized, we would be more tempted to draw a diagram that would be circular, okay? It is more likely that we would use a, a circular diagram to indicate how the different elements of life are interconnected and interrelated. They are not hierarchical in relationship. My guess is that today, at the beginning of the 21st century, we would not place man in an elevated position to woman, right? Our emerging understanding of life has shifted. And we understand today that there is a natural, implicit order to life that does not correspond to the pyramid diagram of the old cosmology. Human. Correspondingly, in the new cosmological understanding, we are coming to be aware that we as humans are not superior, we are not separate from nature, but we are a part of the entire web of life. And our welfare, our survival, is intricately connected to this web. We are far from independent, far from superior. In fact, we are probably very dispensable. The earth, some are telling us, will do much better without us. Earth doesn't need us. We need the earth. And similarly, the planet Earth. In the new cosmological understanding, Earth is not central. Having the benefit of new understandings that science has given to us, we know that Earth is a mere speck in the universe. And as recently as the 1920s, we thought that the Milky Way galaxy was the entire universe. 
But today, thanks to the Hubble telescope, we know that there are billions of galaxies, each with billions, trillions of stars, very similar to our own sun. In fact, the Hubble telescope has been able to capture images approximately 12 billion light years from Earth. We have only recently understood this. We have only discovered this. Our understanding of morality and the new cosmological understanding is that we are coming to see morality as more than just principles and standards about human-to-human -human conduct. Morality in the new cosmology is about our relationship to all of life. We have a moral responsibility to animals. We have a moral responsibility to trees, to water, to plants. The Lakota Sioux tribe have a beautiful expression, and they use the expression, all my relations, meaning that we are related to every member of the non-human and the human world as well. Gender. In this new cosmological understanding, we are beginning to learn that gender is not simply two distinct and different sexes, i.e. male and female. There is growing research and understanding and acknowledgement that gender differentiates along a continuum. We are hearing much more today about gender identity and the vast array of complexities surrounding this uncovering of who we are. We didn't know this before. We had so, such limited understanding in the old cosmological understanding of gender. We know more today. And time. Time, our understanding of time and the new cosmology has changed drastically. Change is at a pace we can barely keep up with today. Communication is instantaneous. Knowledge is exploding. Transcontinental travel and mobility is rapid. We can live in several different communities, countries, and continents in one lifetime. And we can have more than one relationship or commitment in our lifetime. Vows are no longer permanent for everyone. They may be for some, but not for everyone. Permanence is an old cosmological standard. Impermanence, impermanence, is more the reality of life. Knowledge. We know within the new cosmological understanding that knowledge is not the purveyorship of experts, that there is a great value to indigenous knowledge that adds to our insight and learning about life, and that there is an intelligence in the natural world and indeed in the entire universe that surpasses our own human brilliance. And God, God in the new cosmology, for those of us who are seekers of mystery and the divine, we are waking, awakening to new images and understandings of this phenomenon. God is not male, God is not Catholic, Christian, Jew, Hindu, Buddhist, but indeed God is all of these and more. All of these are expressions of a mystery that human beings have been pondering since, since early consciousness. I recently heard a story, a beautiful story, of children from mixed ethnic backgrounds who were interrupted from their play in the schoolyard. And they were asked this question, where is God? And the Christian children pointed to the sky, but the Hindu children pointed to their hearts. Our image of God needs to be big, as big as life, as big as the universe, and free. The economy. Within the new cosmological understanding, there is a debate about economy. We are asking the hard questions about limit, growth, expansion. Rather than endless consumerism, we are finally asking, what is enough? Rather than an understanding that the Earth's resources are primarily for human use, in the new cosmological understanding, we are asking how we might protect the Earth's resources so that all of life can flourish. The old cosmological understanding of economy is moving towards extinction. It is in our best interest to develop an understanding of economy within a new cosmological framework. And with regard to state and governance, 
How we govern ourselves in the future is a critical question, and the cosmological framework that we choose is even more critical. And the one concept that I've not articulated here tonight, and I'll throw out to you for your consideration, is what would leadership look like in the old cosmological approach and in the new cosmological framework? What would leadership look like? It's important to note that all of our major Western uh, world institutions are rooted in and have come out of the old cosmological understanding. Our economy, our government, medicine, church, education have deep and expansive roots in the old framework. And we know that things are shifting. The old is disintegrating. We are seeing this all around us. And the disintegration we are witnessing is causing anxiety, stress, malaise, depression, just look at what is happening locally in the Catholic Church. I'm not saying that the old was wrong. It was that we didn't know any better. We had limited information and knowledge. Today, we have more knowledge. We have the benefit of extremely sophisticated instrumentation and technological capacity. We need to shift. We are shifting. And as part of the shift, the work is to transform, to reinvent, or to renew our major institutions so that they are functioning out of the new cosmological framework and we can begin to reorient our sweat ourselves toward the flourishing of life, not the extinction of life. So for example, our educational institutions need to see their purpose not as training personnel for exploiting the earth, but as guiding students toward an intimate relationship with the earth. And in this context, we must also consider the political, the economic, and the religious institutions, and our ability to reform them in order to help us establish a more viable way into the future. Thomas Berry says furthermore, our personal work our personal work needs to be aligned with the great work. And that brings me here to Cape Breton. What we do locally, what we do regionally is critical. The place where we live is where we can make the difference. Remember that old saying, think globally, act locally. The God I don't believe in is the god or the gods of the old cosmology. The old cosmology is a story, a worldview that doesn't fit anymore. It is killing us, quite frankly. And for the sake of life, for the sake of the children, we need to accept that things change and we need to change much of what we have believed because our life depends on it. And here is my concluding remark, a short story. It's the story about a conversation between a holy one and a seeker. Holy one, the seeker said, tell me the answer to this great spiritual question. Is there a life after death? And the holy one answered, ah, oh, my friend, the great spiritual question is not is there life after death? The greatest spiritual question of them all is, is there life before death? Much of the old cosmology was concerned about life after death. In our present age, we need to be concerned about life before death. The reinventing of all of our major institutions based on a new cosmological understanding is the great work we need to be about. Thank you very much.